thank you for coming out on a rather chilly evening tonight uh, to hear the latest in the Global Public Health Lecture Series. Um, before I get to our speaker, I just want to mention that um, we've got a sign-up sheet there for people who are from the community and also from any students that are enrolled in the course. Make sure you sign in. Um, that sign-in sheet is also going to put your name into the hat for the drawing of a free copy of my book that's going to happen at the end of the, uh, at the end of the semester. And so the more times you come to the lecture, the more chances you have of, uh, of winning that lottery. Um, be sure to put your email address uh, on the sign-in sheet so that we can contact you just in case we don't get there when we draw the uh, final finalists out of the hat. Um, so, um, this evening, uh, we're very happy to have uh, uh, Kirsten Tucker uh, give a talk about her experiences in Uganda last summer as a member of the Global Grizzlies, a student club here at the University of Montana that does wonderful things uh, uh, overseas. Uh, Kirsten is in her final year. Uh, she's going to graduate as a university scholar. She'll have a bachelor's degree in human biology and a minor in global public health. Uh, she'll be applying to medical school this spring. She wrote to me that she's passionate about global health, and of course she spent this past three months uh, uh, in Uganda observing and learning at a local hospital. I think what's particularly impressive about uh, Kirsten is that not only did she go there with the Global Grizzlies, but she stayed on uh, even longer. So I guess we're going to hear all about that today. So please join me in, in welcoming Kirsten Tucker for tonight's lecture. Thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. I'm excited to be able to share this with you. Um, so let's get started. OK, so um, as Peter said, my name is Kirsten, and I am a student here. So I'd like to emphasize the fact that I'm a student, so I'm not a doctor or medical professional. Um, so all of the things I'm going to talk about tonight come from observations as well as conversations that took place while I was in Uganda um, and learning. So I'm just here to share those with you. I'm a human biology student, global public health student. I'm also part of the Davidson Honors College, as well as the Frankie Global Leadership Initiative program. And so those, all of those things are um, huge contributors contributors to how I was able to go on this amazing trip this summer. And I'm also an advocate, just kind of fun fact about me, so I'm a tour guide here on campus as well, which is a lot of fun. So, um, so this summer, like I said, I went with the Global Grizzlies, so it's a group here on campus, and every summer they send 10 students to Uganda to observe and kind of shadow in a local hospital there, which is a really awesome experience. And then they stayed for a month, and then after they left, I stayed for an additional eight weeks, so I was there for three months total, total at this hospital. Um, so we went to Uganda, in case you don't know, it's right above Lake Victoria, so... Um, East Africa, and then we went to Agonga, which I have circled on the map up there. So it's around four hours away from Kampala, which is the capital city, and it's also really close to Jinja, which is a more popular tourist town, I guess, that's close by. And so that's where I spent pretty much all of my time. Um, and so we lived with a host family there, and this is the house we stayed in up in the corner. And so the host family didn't actually stay at the house with us, but they owned it, and they would come and spend all day there, um, cook for us, take care of us, everything like that. And so we had kind of a front courtyard, back courtyard area, and that's where we spent a lot of our time if we were there because the house was smaller on the inside. Um, so you can see this is my, one of my favorite things was little kids that lived around us thought we were really weird because um, we had music and things playing. And so they would peek in the gate and try and see what was happening and going on. Um, so it was always really funny. They'd make faces at us. We'd make them back. They would run away laughing. So it was a really good time. And then this is some of the food we had. Um, chapati, which is their traditional, it's like bread, tortilla. We learned how to make that. Um, we taught them how to make American food like mashed potatoes, which they have a lot of potatoes, but we taught them how to mash them and they thought that was really fun. So we kind of learned from each other. They taught us how to butcher words in their language pretty much because it's really hard to pronounce. Um, and they were very patient with us when it came to that. They also have a lot of rice, beans, and a lot of avocados, which was incredible and I definitely miss that. Um, and then, so just kind of like this picture of the backyard. Um, I was mostly taking this because of the chickens in it, because um, then we ate them later that night. So it was <laughs> so something that you kind of forget that you, you have to kill the chicken first. And so that was one of those cultural experiences that um, was kind of unique 
and fun. So to me, the most important, like the medical experience was really cool and I learned a lot, but the most important experiences to me were those of getting to know um, my family there as well as making friends. Um, so the one I'm hugging here, that's our mama. She's Mom BT. She's the one that took care of us. She cooked for us. Um, she almost made us eat too much because she was very worried if we didn't eat as much as she thought we should be <laughs> eating. So it was always funny. Um, and then these two in the middle, it's Barbara and Caleb. They're siblings. They live next door and so they'd come over all the time and hang out with them. Um, we taught them card games. They taught us their card game. It's actually something I learned that was kind of funny was they have packs of cards like we do but they only think it can be used for one game which is pretty much Uno <laughs> and so they were amazed that you could play multiple games with the same cards so we would spend hours playing cards together um, and then their little brother bright is up in the corner he and I became really good friends especially after he found out I had a bag of M&Ms um, is when <laughs> he started hanging out with me a lot more so um, it was just really good time exchanging culture which um, especially when these kind of trips and medical trips the exchange of culture is one of the most important parts and I'll talk a little bit about that later as well um, so the Agonga District Hospital is where I spent my time shadowing and where we spent our time shadowing and these just briefly just some pictures so it was uh, their hospital isn't one building it's actually a compound and each ward has its own building so there's male um, female pediatrics they had OR which they called theater because they use the British medical terms um, ER which they called casualty they had labs dental clinic antenatal clinic and then they would actually in these places hold clinics weekly so they had like a diabetes clinic and I would actually help there on Tuesdays because um, I was a CNA so I can take blood pressure so I go take blood pressures for the 40 or more patients that would come in and then meet with a doctor about their diabetes and a lot of for a lot of patients that's the only time they ever get their blood pressure and their blood sugar checked was actually at the clinic so it was really cool to see that um, this is just a fun picture so this is a baby coming back for a checkup it's kind of hard to see but they have little harnesses that they attach to fruit scales and they just hang them in those from the tree and that's how they weigh them so it was um, just really cool to see them using stuff. This is a TB clinic um, that they were having outdoors. They're wearing the masks, which a lot of those are the ones we brought, so it was cool to see them being used. Um, as you can see, there's a chicken walking around. So the chickens wander around the hospital, and they'd actually end up in the wards at some points too, which was always funny because that's not something you're used to seeing here in the United States is a chicken wandering around your doctor's office. So that was cool and then this is a walkway to the in between the different wards they do have covered walkways that way if you're transporting a patient to surgery and it's raining they don't get rained on which is good um, and then this is the entrance to the hospital kind of the main focus of this one was the TB sign they have a lot of signs encouraging people that treatment is possible for different diseases and encouraging them to come in and get help because that's something that they struggle with in Uganda which um, I'll also be talking about later so for the first month, while well, the whole team was there, I spent a lot of time in the male and female wards. And these wards, this is, I believe, the male ward, from what I can tell, um, but they look a lot alike, so it's kind of hard to distinguish. So you can see kind of a few things off bat. First of all, there's beds are just kind of crammed in. They fit as many as they can in there. There's probably around 40. Um, beds and it's divided into three sections by little half walls that are around that you know just up to your hip or a little bit higher and so the first section would be for injured patients post-op patients the second section is for like patients who are there with malaria or other illnesses and then the furthest back is actually the patient for infectious diseases so p patients with TB which is probably a lot of you know TB is spread through the air um, droplets in the air and so the main issue with that is the only thing separating a patient with TB from a patient without TB is a little half wall in between, which they do their best to kind of keep patients away from that, but they only have so many resources. So you can also see the ceilings um, based on the qual quality of the ceilings. This hospital was built in 1968 and it hasn't really been remodeled since, and so things are kind of starting to fall apart. Um, but you can't really close down a hospital to, re to fix it there. So. And the windows are all open. This is to provide airflow, which is good because it's really hot there and humid. But also airflow is one of the ways they can prevent the spread of TB and other infectious diseases because it keeps the air moving. The only problem with that is it allows for a lot of flies and mosquitoes to come in, which doesn't help when you have malaria um, and infection rates. So. It's kind of interesting. So what we would do there mainly is shadow. This is where the bulk of our shadowing was done because we could do rounds with the doctors. And the doctors there were incre 
sorry, incredible, they would stop at each patient, they would explain what they presented with, what they had, how they were treating them, and talk with us. They even knew quite a bit about how we would treat them in the United States, so they would compare their methods to our methods and why they would choose certain treatments. They also, once they found out that a lot of us had taken anatomy, they thought it was really fun to quiz us. Um, and so that was interesting, although sometimes tricky because they do use British terms, and so, which is slightly different, so we'd be sitting there saying the same answer to each other and neither of us knew <laughs> that we were both agreeing. Um, and yeah, and then the other thing we would do is there's, for this entire ward, there's one nurse, maybe two at a time, um, and she's responsible for everyone. And so during treatment time, that means she has to be the one that gives every single patient all their medications. And so their medications, because of, uh, to keep them last longer, they come in little vials that have powder in it. And so the one way we found that we could help was just by adding the saline to the vials and mixing it so that then the nurse could go and administer those drugs because that was something that takes no training because you're just mixing vials, but something that saves them a little bit of time and kind of helps out there. We would also do patient transport transport from the wards to the ER or from the to the OR. Um, this picture is just kind of fun. They actually have this is like their store area that they have on the hospital campground campground compound. Um, and so patients can go buy their tubs, which I'll talk about what they use those for later, is water buckets, sheets, anything that they might need because they actually have to provide their own bedding, they provide their own food, and they provide everything for themselves. So a lot of the family members you see are actually there because they're the ones cooking and cleaning for their patients. Um, yeah, so that's what I did for the first month. Um, the second month, I spent most of my time in the maternity ward, um, and the maternity ward was really awesome because OBGYN um, pediatrics is something that I'm really interested in, so here I was able to see um, childbirths and everything like that. So the setup of this ward is that there are three delivery beds and three recovery beds. They're only separated by these little curtains wrapped around it, so not much privacy for the women. Um, and because they give, they have around 20 deliveries a day, three beds is not very many. Um, so you're pretty much only allowed on the bed if you're actively delivering or if they're just examining you and then you get off and go wait. So there's a lot of women just sitting around on the ground waiting outside that are in labor, but they're just not close enough to be delivering. Um, and when women come in to deliver, you'll notice that there's absolutely nothing on the beds and it's because they bring everything. So they bring a tub, which functions as something to carry things in, but also because there's no bathroom anywhere nearby and when you're delivering a child, you don't want to have to like walk far away on uneven ground. Um, I can imagine. I, but um, so they bring, they can also use the bucket as that and then their family member will dump it. So it's kind of two purpose. They also bring their own plastic sheets, which they put down and that serves as the barrier between the bed and between them because um, fluid birth can be a little bit messy. Um, and then they bring their own razor blades, which they use for cutting the cord and sometimes episiotomies. They also bring their own gauze and their own cotton for cleaning up and for making pads afterwards. And then they bring blankets for the baby, um, clothes for themselves, pretty much all of that stuff. They'll also actually bring surgical gloves. Um, the hospital does have gloves, but they have a tendency to kind of run low or run out. And so they ask the patients bring their own. Um, that way they can always have gloves because they like to wear gloves with every patient for infectious reasons and just because it's messy um, and they actually use the like little ridge at the end of a surgical glove they'll actually break that off and that's what they use to tie cords because they don't have cord clamps um, or cord ties very often so um, in this ward I did a lot of cleaning a lot of just helping clean up all the counters clean up all the extra garbage lying around because childbirth is not a slow process once it's like you're delivering so things just kind of get left cleaning up the beds in between the women um, and then the other thing I would do is, I get they called it assisting with the delivery, but I wasn't. I promised I wasn't doing anything crazy. Um, it was just once they had cut the cord, they'd hand me the baby, and then I'd go weigh it and then wrap it up and usually hold it until mom was ready to have it back. And that was something that obviously the midwives were very capable of doing, but usually they didn't have the time because they're the, there's only like one or two midwives, and so they're trying to take care of mom, make sure um, the placenta delivers correctly and all of that so they don't have a huge amount of time to focus on baby. So that's something that I would help with. So that's me just wrapping up um, a baby baby that is in that blanket you just can't see it so yeah so the Aganga District Hospital is a level five referral facility um, in Aganga or in Uganda I'll go through kind of the breakdown in a second of how the levels work so it was built in built in 1968 um, and it was built to serve around 250,000 people at that time so the surrounding area 
Uganga and the surrounding districts. Um, and so it was built with only 100 beds. Um, in 1968, just for reference, the population of Uganda Uganda was around 9 million. Um, now the population is 43 million, probably higher, because that was, I believe, in 2016 or 2017. Um, and so the issue with that is they haven't really been able to add any beds to the hospital. So I think they've done some, but it's still around 100 beds. Same amount of room and everything, and now they're serving 1.5 million people in their area. So quite a big difference, not a lot of change to match that with the hospital themselves. And they only have 176 total staff members at the hospital, and that includes administration, nurses, doctors, everything. It's only 176 people, and they're supposed to serve an area of 1.5 million. So this can lead to some challenges. Um, the first one being they have an overwhelming number of patients. So according to the packet of information they gave us, gave us they see around 320 outpatients patients per day. That does not count the pe people actually in the wards themselves. Um, and so, I mean, when we would walk by the outpatient area, it was constantly full of people just waiting, waiting to be seen and everything like that. Um, another issue is the high cost of power. Um, electricity, I mean, I don't know exactly what it costs, but from talking with a lot of the people in the host family, it has a high cost. And so a lot of people can't afford it, or in the case of the hospital, they can afford it, but the power's not consistent. And Iganga in general, it would just go out, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days. And so the small amount of resources they do have would stop because they don't have electricity for those. And I don't think they had many generators, just maybe one for the operating room. Um, employment, they have a hard time getting enough employees to c handle that many people. And one of those reasons is they like to support the employees by providing housing is something they do there. But the housing was built back in 1968 to support the amount of staff they had then. And so they don't have the housing for the people that they need now in order to take care of this increase in population. Um, and so a lot of times they have to hire nurses that are able to find housing in the area, um, which because of just costs and how much these nurses make, which is pretty much nothing, is really hard for them to be able to do. So that was another issue we saw a lot. Infrastructure, I mean, you saw a picture of the building. It's the, they're not doing so hot in some of those buildings. They do have a few new ones, but the ones that are still there definitely need work, which was beyond the scope of the 10 students who went down there. So um, we did repaint a few signs, though. It was like the one thing we did on our free time, just because. Um, sanitation, so this is, a picture, this is in the labor and delivery suite. Those are their garbage cans. This is actually their sharps container. And so they use whatever cardboard box they have lying around, cut a hole on top and stick the needles in there. Um, this can be concerning because needles can go through cardboard. So you'll have needles kind of sticking out the side. Sometimes the seams of the boxes start falling apart, which means all your sharps start spilling out. And those are hard to put back in a box <laughs> without getting poked. Um, and then a lot of times the needles won't go all the way in, so they're sitting there. So it's not the best option, but it's what they have. Um, and then the garbage cans are supposed to be, one's supposed to be for medical waste and one's supposed to be for trash, but no one can remember which one's which. And so everything just goes in everything. Um, and so <laughs> it's not the most organized system, but that's what they have and they make it work really well. So um, lack of tests and lack of supplies. So the lab on the, at the hospital can do very few tests. They can check for TB, HIV, hepatitis. They can do the malaria smears to see if a patient has malaria, and that's pretty much it. And so the problem with that is it's really hard to treat a patient who has an infection if you don't know what kind of bacteria or what kind of infection you're dealing with. Um, or if a patient comes in and you're like, you either have a virus or you have strep throat, but we can't check. So what they do is they just treat everyone with broad spectrum antibiotics which has, can lead to antibiotic resistance, but you don't really have another option at that point because you don't have any way of checking or finding other sources. So that was um, kind of an issue that we noticed as well. And supply-wise, there's a lot of supplies missing. So the hospital wards are allowed to restock on Mondays, and that's it. So if they start running out by the end of the week, they have to. That was a microphone. Oops, sorry, I thought it moved. Um, so if they run out by the end of the week, they just have to make do until they can restock on Monday. Um, and what's funny is we learned that the patients actually know this, which is why from Monday to Wednesday there's a lot of patients, and then there's not many patients for the rest of the week because they know that there's not going to be as many supplies, so they'll wait as long as possible. So you get a lot of patients on Sunday who couldn't make it to Monday, um, and so they are there for that reason. Um, and then infectious disease control, I kind of talked about that already. They don't have a lot of places to put people who have infectious disease or a lot of ways to clean up after them. There's no hand sanitizer in these places. Um, so that's just soap and water if they have soap. And then this is the OR. So this curtain actually leads to the operating room right there. Um, and 
this is like where you can just walk in. And so what they have you do in order to be kind of more sanitary is you take off your shoes, cross the line, and then they have like sandals that you can put on instead. Um, so you're still walking in with regular clothes. And then you have a lot of nurses that are in the operating room just wearing sandals and socks, which isn't the best for their safety as well. Um, yeah. But it was also, there's a lot of achievements for these hospitals. Like they do amazing and they can take care of the patients that they have with their supplies. And that was really impressive to me. So they are one of the best performing hospitals in the country, which is really cool. They also work on a lot of staff development. So every once in a while they'd have like someone come talk about traumatic brain injuries and teach them about those as well as teaching them how to handle it with those supplies. And those are people within their own hospitals that are doing it. So they continue working on making sure their staff is up to date and educated and progressing in a positive direction. Equipment wise, like I said, they run low on equipment, but what's nice, I mean, but they make do with what they have. So for example, we had a mom who was um, crowning, but she couldn't get the baby all the way out because her bladder was really full. And so they needed to catheterize her in order to drain her bladder. Um, but they didn't have a catheter because they had run out earlier in the week. So they had to rip off a piece of IV tubing um, and use that to catheterize the mom and drain her bladder, which was unfortunately very painful for mom, but a lot better than the alternative of what could have happened if her bladder had been damaged or burst or if baby had been stuck for too long. Um, so it's not definitely not up to our standards of what we would think, but they can still do it. And that was like an important thing to learn. They have done some renovation. They built some new buildings. Um, and then this was something that I really thought was a, a cool or a really nice program was that they partner with medical schools in Uganda as well as nursing schools around there. So throughout the summer and throughout the year, they'll actually have students come volunteer or work for internships in order to learn, which means the hospital gets help with their staffing issue because now they have more nurses and medical students. Um, and also at the same time, the students learn and are prepared to then come back and actually work once they've graduated. So, okay, so Uganda in general, um, population of 43 million, their life expectancy is around 60 years old, so not super high, um, but their fertility rate is really high right now. It's 5.6. I believe the United States is around 1.8 um, kids per woman, so they have a huge growth right now in their population, which also means that the majority of their population is like below the age of 14. Um, and so right now is a really important time for them because if they can get those students educated, they can progress, then their country's gonna end up in a really great place. Um, so they have 155 hospitals total. Uh, you can read those. So two are national hospitals, so like the big ones in uh, Kampala, the capital, and then the regional hospitals, and then the rest of them are general hospitals, which is what we were at during our time. Um, 65 of them are government owned, so they have a lot of privately owned for-profit hospitals as well as hospitals that are run by outside organizations, non-governmental organizations, and things like that. Um, and then just so you kind of know, because to me I was like, well, what is 100? 155 hospitals in that country look like. So 0.5 hospital beds per 1,000 people. And then I put our stats up there just so you can kind of see. Um, and then only 0.1 physician per 1,000 people. So they do have um, low rates for that. Part of the reason is their medical schools are for them very expensive, but they don't offer any financial aid, scholarships, loans or anything. So the only people who can go to medical school are those whose families are wealthy enough to send them in the first place, which limits the number of doctors that you could have. So diseases that are common in Uganda, um, the first one is TB. I mentioned that several times because that's the one that they're really currently trying to reduce. Um, their incidence per 100,000 people is 201. Um, comparatively, ours is three. So their rates are really high right now. Um, but they are doing a lot to try and bring that down, a lot of public education and outreach. Their HIV prevalence is 5.9%, which I think in the 80s it was around 20%. So they've actually done a lot to bring it down. This is actually a poster that they use, and they had them all up over the hospital encouraging that um, people stay faithful to just one partner and decrease the spread of HIV. So. Uh, and then Uganda, 43% of the people who have TB also have HIV, which causes a lot of stigmatization against those people because people will have the symptoms of TB and they'll know that, but they don't want to find out they have TB because they think that means they have HIV or they think their neighbors will then think they have HIV and they're afraid of being um, ostracized because of that. And so they won't seek treatment, which obviously doesn't help with spreading TB. 
Um, and then malaria is the other one because of, they have those type of mosquitoes, and that is 218.3 um, people per 1,000 every or incidence rate. And so that's um, a lot of the reasons people were in the hospitals was because of malaria and um, complications of malaria. So their healthcare structure, then hot top is national referral, then regional referral. So these are just kind of like they cover smaller and smaller amounts of area and have higher and higher levels of care. So national is the highest, it's for the entire country, regional, and then district is what we were at, so the Agonga District Hospital. Um, and then below that is like health centers, and from my understanding, that's like a county hospital, like covers an entire a county. And level three and two, those are like the small, like one room clinics that you'd have in a village, which really can't do much besides basic um, treatment, so then they would refer up. And so each hospital just kind of refers up if they can't handle whatever a patient has. Um, the one that was really, um, surprising and really I thought was super interesting is the village health care teams that they have and these are actually community members so our house mom was actually one they're community members that are trained in HIV TB and other common illnesses and they actually go around and ask their neighbors are you still getting your treatment for TB has anyone else in your family started coughing do you still need more medications for HIV so they check on each other and this is encourages support as well as destigmatizing the whole thing because then they understand what's good. Um, also, we had a few doctors at the, um, our physical therapist at the hospital, as well as our TB doctor would actually do home visits in order to treat people who couldn't get to the hospital. So like the physical therapist, if his patient couldn't walk, he could go to them um, and help them. The problem is a lot of that has to be on their own funding, so. So the challenges that, I talked about the challenges kind of faced at the local level. So this is the challenges at the national level and a lot of these is what causes those challenges. So funding, um, the current health expenditure, pretty much what they do is they kind of level the playing field between currency and um, like cost of living and everything to figure out this comparatively between countries. So per person, Uganda spends around $138 or the equivalent dollars, whereas in the United States, we spend almost 10,000 per person. So you can see there's a, a, a small difference um, between where we're at there. Um, five, they only spend, or of the amount of money they spend, only 5.6 of it's actually spent on health. Um, and so they do, they, a lot of their spending is focused elsewhere and not as much on the health sector, which shows based on the lack of supplies and everything that we observed. Um, and then of all the money they spend on health, including foreign aid, 40% of that is actually foreign aid. So that's great because they're able to run it, but the problem is that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable to be consistently receiving money from outside sources and be depending on it so heavily. Like all of their HIV and TB medication is free for the public because it's given to them by foreign aid. Um, corruption is a huge thing there. Government level, I don't fully understand how their government works, so I can't tell you exactly what that means, but public um, notices. This is one example we saw a lot of is it says that all services at the hospital are free, which for the most time that is completely true, but there are a few doctors like the one doctor who does C-sections will make his patients pay him for the C-sections. Um, and they don't know their rights, so they don't say anything, and they also just need a C-section, so they just go along with it. Um, and even the nurses will know, but they don't know how to deal with that. Um, so there's corruption at the local level as well. And then the stigma and negative stereotypes, I already talked about that. Um, so the main thing I learned is to look at the positive elements, because those are the ones we can actually learn from as our own healthcare system. So they do have free healthcare. I'm not saying that politically, I'm just saying they do have free healthcare. Um, so, which is great, because they don't have health insurance, but this means that everyone, no matter what, can get access to healthcare. So there's no discrimination based on how much you make or where you're from, it's just you get healthcare because you came to our hospital. So we're gonna do the best we can for you. And I think that is something that everyone can learn from is just treating everyone that way. Um, they also have the huge community involvement. We don't see that because I mean, probably a lot of us in this room do not see our primary care physician as much as we're supposed to or do our yearly checks up, checkups, because I know I'm guilty of that as well. Um, and so the fact that they had the community involvement to get everyone on board and try and solve those health problems from that level is something that I think we could also learn from. Um, and then these are just their statements. You can read those if you want. But pretty much the point of me putting on here, this is from the hospital, and this is from the Department of Health, so the government level. And what I can tell from both of these is the fact that 
you can tell by reading them that they care about their people and they want to do the best they can and they want to make sure everyone has equal access to health care and gets the help they need. Um, it's just whether or not they can based on resources. So up in the corner, that's me, obviously. And then <laughs> Ben, he is a med student and he would constantly talk about how much he loved his community and how much he wanted to come back so he could help them. And he loves doing outside village clinics, like he'll go out and do outreach. And so he was kind of like the person that I associated with this mentality of giving back um, in order to grow and become better. So overall, um, yeah, overall, it's pretty much what I said. They are, have an incredible system. It just needs help. Um, and pretty much everything I said can be summed up in this really awesome short film that Reese, he's right there. <laughs> he um, was part of my team. He actually made this while we were there. It's a documentary on the healthcare system. So it covers a lot of what I talked about. But um, I'm going to show you the last like minute or so because I think it sums up pretty much what I'm trying to say. But you actually get it here from the people and the doctors in Uganda. So it means a little bit more than me <laughs> saying it. Um, so if I, can, I should have it pulled up so that we can just watch it. So I would definitely recommend you watch the whole thing as well because that was just the ending. Um, but my biggest takeaway that I learned and learned from that is the, what like the doctor, Dr. Issa said, is that we can learn from each other and we can exchange knowledge. And that was something that I learned really well is because they can learn stuff from us, we can learn stuff from them. It's that culture exchange just like I talked about in the beginning with getting to know people. That is something that would allow both of our countries to work together and move forward in a positive direction. We can't just throw money at things, we have to work together to do that. Um, and so I really like that ending. Um, and so, yeah, those are my sources in case you're interested. It's pretty much the World Bank has a lot of really cool statistics um, and I had to narrow down my options. But um, so yeah, so the Global Grizzlies team, um, Frankie Global Leadership Initiative, and then ELI, which is the company we traveled through, I wouldn't have been able to do this without them. So thanks to them. And then also to the Global Public Health Program um, for their support during all of this and then for letting me share here tonight. Um, but that's all I have for you. So what questions do you have? Yeah. Oops. Um, so first of all, I wanted to point out that you said they a lot, which is just like a, and I, I, a form of othering that just felt a little bit weird. And second of all, I wanted to see how long, since you stayed for so long, how you adjusted coming back to the U.S. after staying three months in one particular yeah. place for so long and being so intimate with a particular community. And once you become fairly integrated, how did yeah. you find adjusting? For sure. I mean, it was difficult from levels like in the airport, there's an automatic flushing toilet and it scared the crap out of me because <laughs> I forgot that those existed. So like little things like that, but also just um, you really get to know people and you miss the people um, and just you kind of just, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it is like it becomes us home and then you have to leave that again. So it was hard. It was actually harder for me to come back than it was for me to go there and adjust just because everything here is so different and everyone's priorities here are so different and everything. Yeah. Is it open 24 hours a day like you said? It is. There's like 23 births a day. Yeah. 
nights. Nights too, yes. Yeah, so they are open 24-7 um, because the wards and everything in the ER is. Um, I was only there during the day just because safety of walking on the streets at night. Um, but they are open all the time. <coughs> Other questions? Oh, sorry, on the way back. So it seems like you kind of have like three big issues that they were facing and, and the lack of skilled staff, the lack of the infrastructure, and the lack of the supplies. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense from the, the doctors you were shadowing and the staff you were working with, like which one they felt would be the most helpful to have more resources <laughs> Yeah, I think it was mostly the supplies, because the infrastructure is just a building. Like, as long as it does what it's supposed to, it stands there. It's fine. It'd be great if they could have new buildings. But the supplies, I think, was the largest. And we got that a lot from the doctors, because they are brilliant. They have the same knowledge we, our doctors here have. They just can't do anything with it. And we asked, I think it was one time we asked, because um, there's a lot of patients with uh, bowel obstructions or twisted bowels. And we said, well, why does that happen? He goes, well, we don't have the money to research it, so we don't know. And so just the supplies and the lack of like supplying to supplies to research as well as supplies to support their patients was huge. Um, and they talked about that a lot, actually. You know, I had a question, <coughs> a question along those lines, and that is, you know, people have to bring all those things, they have to buy all those things. Is affordability an issue there? I mean, um, what if you couldn't afford to buy a tub? You couldn't afford to bring one of those plastic uh, covers? Uh, you were just out of luck. Um, the people that did, we would make do with what we had in the store, like in our supply. Um, but that didn't seem to be a huge issue. So I don't know if they just don't come to the hospital at that point or if they do and they just have like family help them buy the tarp or whatever. It was hard to tell because a lot of them, a lot of the patients themselves didn't speak English, so it was hard to ask them. Other questions? I think, do you have one? Yeah. yeah. I have two questions. Um, the size of Uganda, how big is that compared to Montana? I think it's smaller. I think I looked that up because we were trying to explain. They didn't understand why me and then the, uh, one of the other volunteers that came down separately from Florida weren't going to hang out all the time. Um, so <laughs> I had to try to explain that difference. And I think it's, um, it's either around the same size or it's smaller. My other question is, why do you think that there's so many children per family? Like, is that traditional or is there lack of, you know, safe sex, contraception? Um, it's both, yeah. So it's hugely traditional. Um, there's still a lot of um, polygamous relationships there, and so yeah, um, and so that ha there's a lot of children that comes with usually those traditionally and culturally. It's also for survival. Like a lot, they rely on their children, especially in old age, to support them that way. Um, and then yeah, access to they have free access to contraception, but they don't have a lot of education about what it is. As well as a lot of times, it's a very strongly patriarchal society. So a lot of times, husbands do not want their wives on birth control. Mal malaria rate seems really high. Is there a lot of conversation about preventive measures for malaria? Or is that not something you interact? I didn't see very much of it, which I was kind of surprised at. I mean, they do the advice, um, they do recommend people use mosquito nets, but I didn't see a huge push to supply those. And I honestly didn't see many in the shops and stuff. Um, and then I think there was a lot of, they come out from 2 a.m. to like sunrise, so try to be in your house at that point. But there wasn't a ton of prevention that I saw happening. And no, no recognition of, or no, in indication that there's any uh, evidence of malaria inoculations anymore, vaccines that are starting to... Uh, is there any recognition of that at all? I did not hear anything about that, no. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I, I was intrigued by the sanitation shop. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, what do you think, some of the rest of you who are here from Global Grizzlies, what do you think about that whole idea of sanitation being a potential project for Golden Grizzlies down the road. I mean, couldn't you clean that whole issue up there in terms of separating out the two disposable mm -hmm. bins and, and making something better for, for the sharp mm -hmm. objects and things like that? Wouldn't that make a nice Golden yeah. Grizzlies project? I think so for sure. And we even brought sharps containers down. They just didn't use them because they were small, so they need we need to find a way to transport a bunch of larger ones down. Um, but we're considering that and then like TB education as well as some of the projects that the future Global Grizzlies could work on is kind of things we're considering. Yes. So you, you mentioned that you didn't know what form of government they have. 
I don't know recently, but they have a very oppressive mm -hmm. form of government where maybe they have access to contraception, but at one point they were punishing anyone who was distributing condoms. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the statistics, the HIV rate increased significantly mm -hmm. and the progression to AIDS. But in Uganda now there is a crisis. The crisis is the newborns are being raised by their grandparents mm -hmm. because their parents were dying from AIDS. Yeah. So that's my comment. I implore you as a potential physician to not do gynecology. We okay. need you to do family medicine or pediatrics. <laughs> yes. That's where we need you. Okay? Yes. Especially if you're from Montana. Okay. They need your expertise. Mm -hmm. yes. You bring a lot to the to the field. Thank you. Did you have some else? I'd like a show of hands. How many of you um, were in the Global Grizzlies group that went uh, with Kirsten last year? How many of you are going next year? All right, great. And I think we should, I'm going to ask you to give Kirsten a round of applause at the end of all this, but I think we ought to take a break here and give Reese a round of applause for that great video that he put together. Um, okay, any other questions? Um, what do you think the future of Global Grizzlies is here at the University of Montana? Look bright? Does it look faltering? Um, you know, what, what do you what do you see down the road after this experience? And you know, those of you who were there last year, are welcome to join in on this. You want to start, Reese? Yeah, sure. I think it's a very good future because I think from the years that I've known since it's. Since I've been here, uh, each year it's gotten a little bit better and more um, of the like culturally integrative experience with each new year. Like last year, we made the decision to uh, continue going back to Uganda <clears throat> to start making our like sustainable relationship with a solid group of people that we actually know on a personal level. So. That's one of the small improvements that we made. And I'd say that's more than a small improvement. Yeah. That's a really big yeah. improvement. It's a great but, step forward. Um, the point being, each each year, with each new year, we're trying to do something something to improve the program from the way it was the previous year. So I think it's yeah. very good. And there's a lot of us who, like Kirsten and I and a couple other members, are sticking around this year to help. <clears throat> kind of help the next group of students in their process of prepping for the trip and um, like educating them about the, the culture we experienced when we were there and our experiences and things that worked well for us and things that didn't work well for us and things like that. So there's a mentorship aspect to it as well, which is good. Yeah, and we're also kind of working on adding kind of a public health aspect to it because health education is something that we can do because it doesn't require any medical training so as long as we can prepare the students they can go down there and help so we're kind of hoping to integrate that and to make it more sustainable and be able to give back to this community that takes us in every summer and um, just lets us be a part of their lives Great. any last questions well I would just like to conclude by saying that um, I think from the presentation that Kirsten gave today, you can see two things. One, that the uh, External Advisory Committee was very um, well um, thought very, very uh, favorably upon uh, the applicants for their award this last year because Kirsten was the uh, winner of the External Advisory Committee's award for doing work in global health overseas. And I think you can tell from this that uh, uh, she was a very deserving candidate. And the second thing I'd like to say, and uh, I don't think this is bragging too much, she kind of recognized it herself, is I, I think that it's clear from her presentation that the minor in global public health uh, is educating some really top-rate students. And uh, she's, she is really uh, able to describe things in Uganda in a very professional way. Uh, 
uh, she's gotten a lot out of that experience. I think she was prepared when she went there from some of the coursework that she had uh, to look into these various issues and to see the bigger picture. Uh, so uh, uh, again, those of you who haven't yet decided on, on whether you want to minor in global public health, uh, recognize from what she did that there's a big, great future there for you if you do make that minor because you're going to learn a lot. Uh, so um, having said all that, I'd like to now thank Kirsten for her presentation and for all the good work that she did in Uganda as well. Thank you.